Hi everybody, Dave Moffat here, recapping Chapter 7 this week. I know a number of you were at the uh, Bisco lunch today, and Pastor Steve said the stories there were very, very good, so I'm glad you could go. Hope this recap helps you. We had a good, good discussion today. Okay, uh, the title of Chapter 7, uh, No More Jackasses, Wrestling with Betrayal Without Becoming a Jerk. Uh, Dan ties together four really interesting concepts here betrayal, uh, self-absorption, reluctance, and gratitude. Uh, things that you normally wouldn't connect together or weave on the same string. So I'll do my best to tie these together. I hope you enjoyed the chapter too. Um, I've listened to this book on audio multiple times now as, as we've prepared for, for each of these sessions. Uh, read them, gone through the summaries. Uh, and it, it, if you're struggling, so, so have I. Uh, it's so deep that you have to unpack it again and again and then the lights slowly come on. That's, that's what I experienced again today. Just going through the chapter uh, in a discussion group in class today was so helpful for me. So uh, be sure to share stories uh, with, uh, with your spouse, with coworkers, with someone else in the class uh, and learn from each other. I think it's, it's a big part of what God wants us to do with this. Okay, Dan talks about uh, betrayal first and uh, calls it the wound of, of envy. Uh, that when leaders fail to deal with their own wounded, woundedness, they fall into unhealthy patterns of leadership. Uh, we can't miss that very first point because that's where it all starts. Uh, we've all been wounded. We've all experienced woundedness. Uh, sometimes we have a hard time naming it and even knowing what it is. We just know we've been hurt. Um, and you can fall into these unhealthy patterns in leadership. If, if, we, don't, uh, if we don't grasp that, we fail to see how this whole thing plays out in our life. So let's, let's be sure we, we catch hold of that. Uh, the more powerful the person's leadership position, the more likely it is that the leader has narcissistic characteristics. Um, okay, and leadership offers the best opportunities on earth to have power, control, and adulation. That's, that's where you can receive those things, but only for a short season because betrayal is assured. Uh, Dan did such a good job of... Uh, explaining how woundedness can lead us into leadership because we don't want to be wounded again. We want a position of power uh, where we can theoretically avoid being wounded. Uh, and we want control uh, and we want respect. And it feels good because it feels like it's healing that original wound. The trouble is betrayal is inevitable. It's inevitable in leadership. And, and God literally sets us up to experience those things for our own good. So we, the very place we run to avoid the wounding, leadership, we're guaranteed to be wounded, and betrayal is, is one of those places. Um, next he turns to self-absorption, uh, because having been wounded uh, and, be, and stepping into those positions of leadership, uh, we can be, start to become self-absorbed if we aren't already. Uh, I like the point he makes that nar narcissism in any form involves the following four aspects. Uh, lack of interest in the perspective of others, that's a failure of curiosity. We can be highly opinionated, that's a failure of humility. We can become emotionally detached, just got to get it done, full speed ahead, we'll worry about emotions later, that's a failure of care. Or we can become ruthlessly utilitarian and just use people, that's a failure of honor. Uh, he did a great job of, of explaining that the antithesis of narcissism is Jesus Christ. Uh, and if we're going to be Christ-like, we've got to root out even these minor forms of narcissism because they're just the opposite of, of Christ. So we can't fail at humility, we can't fail at care uh, or honor or curiosity. Uh, we have to keep striving for those. On the other hand, betrayal is certain, and what is uncertain is how we will embrace betrayal and use it for the growth of character, which is the whole goal. If we're going to grow in Christ-likeness, we have to grow our character. Third, he turns to the topic or the concept of reluctance, um, the tipping point to rest, and he uses the Old Testament story of Jonah. Um, weird story uh, with the fish and being spit out on the beach and... and uh, going to Nineveh and just being furious that he's, that he's calling, he's being told to call them to repent. Um, 
I wouldn't have called Jonah a narcissist without Dan leading us through that chapter, but he says a narcissist believes that the world is rigged to harm, so he's committed to achieving a position of power in order to protect himself from more betrayal, but the God he serves sets him up, uses him, and betrays him by ruining his narcissistic dreams. God simply invites a narcissist to either rage or rest. Um, in one of my studies trying to get a grip on Jonah, I ran across something I hadn't been ta taught before, that Jonah was a well-respected prophet before this incident. He had a, he had a position of, uh, of respect. People listened to him, uh, which wasn't always the case for prophets. Uh, but as God called him to, to go to Nineveh, he ran. Uh, and what got exposed in him was his hatred. This was the dark part. His hatred for God's tendency to forgive people who had betrayed God and, and just didn't deserve it. And he couldn't stand that, even though that's the whole point of calling people to repentance. So it exposed the ugliness in him. And God gave him no choice but to go and do it. Uh, rest comes when we know, this is Dan speaking, rest comes when we can no longer sustain our flight. Jonah couldn't get away. The fish brought him back to the beach. Uh, and we find God waiting for us. We find true rest in surrender. Did Jonah actually surrender? No, that's the sad part of this story. He, the end of the story is just a bitter, angry man. He did what God commanded him to do, but he was just ticked. That, that the Ninevites repented, <laughs> that they did what God called them to do. Um, so God gave him two choices, rage or rest, and he actually chose rage. Uh, we don't have to do that if we can learn from the story. Uh, fourth, he turns to the concept of gratitude, the fruit of humility. Uh, the antidote to betrayal is developing a heart of gratitude, something Jonah never got to, as, as I understand it. If you can, it's humbling to give God all the credit, and it's also a place of deep rest. And you just think about that. I hope you've experienced that in your life when you have had to give God the credit for something that you clearly didn't do. You, you couldn't take the credit because it clearly wasn't you. It's very humbling because you don't, you don't look the greatest. You're just giving all the credit to God. But it's very restful to give God the credit and simply do that. Uh, gratitude opens the heart to acknowledge one's gifts, not with pride, but with amazement and awe. Um, gratitude that you were even part of the story and, and being able to just give God the, the rest of the credit. Um, I told a couple stories today, and, uh, and I mentioned that we, when it comes to uh, uh, betrayal, some of, some of the forms can be so small, uh, simply criticism in a meeting from someone that you thought was supportive or was on board or agreed with you. Um, when you're striving so hard to get something done, to make something happen, to move a group forward, and, and you just get some e even lukewarm criticism or outright criticism, it just hurts. Uh, and you know you need to listen and you need to take that in, but it, it, it can be very hurtful. It can feel like betrayal, even if you don't call it that. Um, so you'll, you'll have your own stories, I'm sure, of, of what betrayal means to you. I shared a couple. Uh, one was a very small story, but, but just extremely painful to me as a young manager. Uh, we had uh, come to Watertown, set up our business here, and uh, I'd had the chance to set this up the way I wanted it because uh, my dad uh, had died of cancer shortly after we arrived, and then my mom went through cancer uh, immediately after him. She was diagnosed only a month later. Um, and so my parents were gone, and I was running the business the way I really wanted to run it. And one of the things we did was we had a, an honor system for pop. So instead of having a pop machine, we sold the employees pop at a lower price with an honor system. We put pop in the fridge. Uh, there was a coffee can to put the money in and just put it in. Nothing to it. And people were really grateful for it until I found out one day that someone had stolen the pop money. All of it. And I was so hurt. And I was surprised how painful that was just to know that someone had betrayed my trust and my respect for them and just stole it. 
And it, it was, I had to talk to our uh, uh, bookkeeper, uh, who was a wonderful older uh, farm wife, somebody who had run a business, who had experienced betrayal. And she just let me express my pain. Um, I just felt violated. Uh, never did figure out who had, but I just shared my pain with the team and said, we're not going to change the system, but please, <laughs> that's just not okay. Uh, we got past that, but in a way it set me up for a, an experience much later with, with much bigger consequences. Uh, on a Friday afternoon, uh, my purchasing manager uh, brought some news to me that was really jarring, that there were checks that had been written in theory, they'd been recorded to our vendors, but he hadn't placed orders for those items. So he strongly suspected that our bookkeeper had written the checks to herself and recorded them to vendors. And it was really tearing him up that that was true. Uh, he hadn't gone to the bank with the information, but he, he, he finally said, I just have to tell you this, because you, you have to know. Um, that person had left work already. I turned to three of my advisors that I trusted completely and asked them what I should do. Does this person go to jail? Uh, is there a chance of getting the money back? Do I have any other alternatives? And three out of three people I respected said, you have to put her in jail. You've got to do it. You can't hesitate. If you don't, she just will go on and do this to another company. You, you, you have to do this. I couldn't stand that thought. I, it didn't sit right with me. Um, and I, I went home uh, and I started to pray. And I prayed off and on all weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, <laughs> no answers. And I was just torn up over what's next. Sunday night came. I told my wife I'm going to stay up and pray. It was 11 o'clock. She went to bed, prayed for me, and went to bed. Somewhere in the next hour or two, God answered my prayer with a simple question. He said, what did I do for you? You forgave me. Thank you. And I knew what I was going to do. Went to bed, slept well, went to work the next morning, called our sales manager into the conference room, and when this uh, bookkeeper came to work, a um, different person than the first person in my story, um, I brought her in and said, all right, two things. Uh, we've discovered the checks that you've been writing to yourself. We know about those. But the next thing I want to tell you is I forgive you. And I got to watch a face go from self-hatred and terror at being discovered to the shock of being shown grace all in less than 10 seconds. I'll never forget that. Um, I didn't know where this would lead. I didn't know what the amounts were. I had no idea what would happen next. I just knew that's what God wanted me to do and just trust him with it. Um, had to tell her that she couldn't work here any longer, obviously. Um, and I was hoping she would help us get to the bottom of it, get it fully uncovered. Uh, she didn't exactly do that at first. But the next thing I did was call her husband, uh, who we knew through Christmas parties, uh, and g give him the difficult news. He knew nothing about it, was shocked, embarrassed. And I said, we'll worry about all this later right now. I'm worried about her. She hates herself. Um, you need to find her and take care of her, and we'll, we'll figure this out later. Okay, here's what God in, unveiled in all that. Um, the amount was 10 times the amount that I was estimating at the time. It was far, far bigger. But she opened up over the next few weeks, um, apologized, showed remorse, uh, talked about some of the pain in her life that she'd gone through, wounding of her own. Uh, I got to spend time with her husband, got to lead him to Christ, uh, got to take him through men's fraternity, which came along in our church shortly after that. Um, and they eventually sold their home to pay back about half the debt, and then her father stepped in and paid the rest. Had no idea that was possible or that it would happen. Um, it was a it was a it was a huge experience in in trust, um, and uh, and just in prayer. And uh, 
I don't know if I've ever prayed that long in my life, um, uh, waiting for an answer that I, I just hadn't received yet. Um, so I learned many, many things from it. I'm very, very blessed. I can't take any credit for any of it, which is what was the, the point of Dan's chapter. Uh, to give God the credit uh, was humbling and, and very, very restful. And he was very, very faithful. And I hope I would have felt the same way if we hadn't gotten a single dollar back. Uh, God is just that good. Uh, so I hope you can uh, reflect on your own experiences with betrayal. And as I said, sh share them with someone else, uh, process them, and see if you have blind spots that need to be uncovered. And, and uh, ask God to help, him, help you do that uh, as you learn from this chapter. Uh, so if I could pray for you, please. Uh, Father, thank you for uh, the opportunities that you gave us to uh, look at betrayal in our lives today, probably bringing up some painful experiences. Uh, help us to see your hand in what took place. Uh, help us to see what you allowed and, and why that you, you want us to grow and you want to build our character. Um, and then lead us forward with, with this new knowledge and with Dan's perspective. Um, and uh, lead us to a place of gratitude. And uh, help us remember that our goal is Christ-likeness. It's, it's not the results and everything else that we're chasing in our business, but it's Christ-likeness and character. Uh, lead us to that, Lord. We need your help, and we know you will help us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Take care.